Tonight on KQED Newsroom, we speak with California's Surgeon General about the state's looming lockdown restrictions and how to ensure the vaccine is distributed fairly. And we speak with California church leaders about the fight to be able to worship indoors during the pandemic, a question they're asking the U.S. Supreme Court to weigh in on. Plus, we take in the unique architecture of Marin County's Civic Center in this week's look at something beautiful. Welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. The death toll from the coronavirus keeps climbing. More than 19,000 people have died in California and more than 276,000 have died nationwide. In a move to curb the rapid rise in cases, this week Governor Newsom announced strict new rules for the state. In regions where intensive care units are more than 85 percent full, all private gatherings will be prohibited and many businesses will have to shut down again, which is expected to occur throughout California this month. Meanwhile, there's a lot of optimism about two vaccines that look likely to get approved in the coming weeks and start shipping before the end of the year. For now, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has recommended that residents and employees of nursing homes be the first to get vaccinated, along with frontline health care workers. Our first guest is here to talk about how to manage through this pandemic, as well as her work to help make sure the vaccine is distributed in an equitable manner. Joining me now by Skype from San Francisco is California's first ever Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris. Dr. Burke-Harris, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Now, compared to other states, California has had a pretty strong culture of wearing masks and socially distancing from others. So how is it that we still find ourselves here at the brink of hospital overruns? Yeah, well, as we're seeing, there's a nationwide surge that's happening. And you're absolutely right. Californians have worked really hard to keep the coronavirus at bay. But we are seeing that with increased mixing, as we've gone about our, our daily lives and kind of opened up uh, a bit more, that the the surge is not sparing California. We are experiencing record high uh, rates of coronavirus. And so we need to, to come together to do what we've done before, uh, which is to you know wear that mask, watch our distance, wash our hands, and uh, stay home during this time so that we can uh, reduce the spread. Well, as you just mentioned, one of the guidelines is to not gather with people outside our households for the foreseeable future. But frankly, people are tired and they see some of our state leaders at social gatherings as well. Do you think it's realistic to expect that they won't travel and have hospitals done all they can to maximize our surge capacity? Well, it's no surprise that people are tired. I think that yeah, you, we're all tired. It's This has been a really difficult and challenging experience, and I want to acknowledge that. But at the same time, we recognize that the these protective measures, they're what we do for our, our friends, our family, our community. They're our way of ensuring that our hospital system doesn't get overwhelmed, right? Because what we heard in the governor's press conference on Thursday was that we are weeks away from having, uh, you know, overwhelming our ICU capacity. And it is up to the California public, it's up to each of us to be part of preventing that from happening. All right. Well, turning to the light at the end of the tunnel here, the distribution of a vaccine, you're the chair of California's Community Vaccine Advisory Committee, and that's focused on an equitable distribution of this vaccine. Who's participating in this committee? And can you tell us a little bit about the specific concerns you're hearing from them? We have a wide range of partners, advocates, community representatives that are really part of this process of weighing in on our vaccine distribution strategy. And the, the entire process is grounded in the three principles of safety, equity, and transparency. So these are public meetings. Uh, members of the public can call and listen in on how these conversations are happening. And what we're hearing is, as you mentioned, first and foremost, issues of equity. That is what we've been hearing a tremendous amount and there are strong voices uh, in that. 
We're also hearing from our, uh, you know, advocates around uh, disability rights, around labor, around uh, advocates for our seniors. So we really have this rich chorus of voice, voices that are informing our uh, decisions around vaccine distribution in California. I just want to get into the details of that a little bit. You know, specifically in the black and brown community, there has been a lot of suspicion um, of the medical community because of historical episodes such as the Tuskegee experiment in which black men with syphilis were left untreated. What are you hearing from black and brown communities about their willingness to trust this vaccine and to take it? What we're hearing is that there are tr issues of trust. And so it's critically important for us to be utilizing our trusted messengers. We know that vulnerable communities, um, that some of that distrust is well-founded by historical harms that have taken place. And so it is important to be not only mindful of that, but to be making efforts to recognize and respond to the impact of those past harms on current perceptions. And that's part of the reason why it's so important for us to reach out through trusted messengers, uh, through community networks, to be able to ensure that our vulnerable communities, our black and brown communities, can be protected by this vaccine. Unfortunately, access to testing hasn't been evenly distributed as much as we may have wanted that. People with more money and power have often been able to get tested more easily and more frequently than those without. How do you make sure that doesn't happen with the vaccine? You're absolutely right. And that's part of the reason why, as California has implemented our equity metric, as we're holding counties accountable for addressing uh, increased vulnerability of certain communities, we're also pairing that with resources, right? So we're not just saying, hey, you guys got to do it, but we're not going to give you any resources to do it. The California Department of Public Health is providing resources for our local county departments of public health to be able to address the areas that have the greatest vulnerability. Uh, Dr. Burke Harris, will you take the vaccine as soon as it is available to you? The moment it will be available, yes. You don't have any concerns about its safety or efficacy? I think that we are looking at the data, right? Currently, it's still under review. California is doing its own scientific safety review. And I deeply trust in that safety review process. The folks who are part of that safety review process are, ex are experts. They're, ex they're extremely uh, well versed in reviewing the safety of vaccines. And the minute they say that it's safe, not only will I sign up to take it, but when it's available, I will make sure that my entire family receives it as well. You were appointed as California's very first Surgeon General just about a year ago. Then the pandemic struck. How have your goals been impacted by the pandemic? It's a great question. Coming into office, one of my signature initiatives that I have been working on since starting was something called the ACES Aware Initiative. And it's an initiative to raise awareness and train our healthcare providers to understand how stress and trauma impacts health and how to respond with evidence-based trauma-informed care. And while we've all been all hands on deck with the coronavirus pandemic, it turns out that this initiative has been more important than ever because so many Californians now are experiencing significant levels of trauma and adversity and um, responding with trauma-informed care, having a trauma-informed healthcare workforce turns out has never been more important. So we have trained since January of 2020, more than 15,000 healthcare providers on how to recognize the signs of how trauma is affecting health and how to respond with evidence-based care. All of this in the middle of a global pandemic. You're a pediatrician by training, and much of your work has been with childhood trauma. Now, kids aren't impacted in the same way physically in terms of the coronavirus as adults. What are your concerns about their social, their psychological health? Well, there are significant concerns. Uh, what we're seeing is that the, you know, the reports for child maltreatment 
uh, declined dramatically after the shelter in place order uh, early in the pandemic. And while that may sound like good news, we know that it, it, child maltreatment didn't go away. It's likely just being unreported. Also, we, you know, we think about children's uh, social and emotional development and how that's impacted by uh, not being with peers, not being in school. So these are certainly big concerns. And, uh, you know, one of the some of the things that we know make a big difference is that we as parents and caregivers, as as uh, folks who care for young folks, you know, my husband and I have four boys. We have a really important role in providing a safe, stable and nurturing relationship for kids. And that connection is actually the most important thing to help kids thrive during this time. We've learned in the wake of natural disasters, there's also a broader public health toll with an increase in things like stroke and heart attacks. As the Surgeon General of California, how are you now putting that knowledge to use to prevent those outcomes? Absolutely. So we recognize that when we have a huge disruption like a pandemic or other natural disasters, that folks have more limited access to uh, disruption and access to their usual healthcare channels, right? That they may have uh, disruption in, to some of the resources that we use to keep ourselves healthy, right? Like our, our ability mm -hmm. to, to go outside and have safe places to play and, and um, uh, employment and food and all of those things. And this is why the Office of the Surgeon General has partnered across Health and Human Services to work to not only communicate to healthcare systems, healthcare providers, we issued an all plan letter to all of the health plans across California to help raise awareness about this as an issue and inform our healthcare providers on how we can connect patients to the resources that they need to keep themselves healthy. And how have you personally been impacted by the coronavirus? Have you or any of your family members tested positive? Fortunately, none of uh, my family members and I myself have never uh, tested positive. But, you know, I'm affected in the way that many of us are affected. Uh, you know, my mom has been, uh, is not in great health. Earlier this year, she had to spend several weeks in the intensive care unit. And I was really grateful that there was a bed for her, mm. right? And so just as any Californian, just as you or anyone watching this tonight would wanna make sure that if their own mother or their father or their grandmother were ill, that they would be able to receive the life-saving care. And the, the care that my mom received in the ICU earlier this year did save her life. I'm grateful that bed was available. And the reason that bed was available was because of the work of all the Californians who stay home, who wear masks, who wash their hands, even when it's hard. Dean Burke Harris, California's Surgeon General, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Turning now to religion. The debate is escalating over whether churches should be allowed to hold indoor services during the pandemic. Back in May, a group of California churches went before the U.S. Supreme Court with a plea to allow religious services to resume. They argued that the governor's limits on how many people could worship indoors during the pandemic violated their freedom of religion. At the time, the court voted to uphold the state's rules, saying churches should be treated in the same fashion as secular gatherings, such as concerts or sports events. But the makeup of the Supreme Court has since changed, with the addition of conservative justice Amy Coney Barrett. And that new court just overturned New York's restrictions on indoor worship, saying those restrictions do violate the First Amendment's guarantee of religious liberty. Now the California churches are taking their challenge to the Supreme Court once again. Joining us now to talk about their desire to resume indoor services are Bishop Art Hodges, who joins me via Skype from San Diego, and Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni of San Francisco. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining. Before we get into the specifics of the legal challenge before the Supreme Court, would you please each share with us what changes you'd like to see to the current restrictions? And Archbishop Cardelloni, I'll begin with you. Uh, thank you. Yes, we've been trying to sustain our people during the time of this uh, pandemic. Uh, we have about a half a million Catholics in the Archdiocese of San Francisco and 90 parish communities covering the three counties on the west side of the bay. Uh, 
we would like to see uh, basically equality. We've been unjustly discriminated against by being locked out of our churches while secular activity activities have been able to continue. The Constitution does privilege First Amendment activities. Paramount among them is religious practice. We would look for equality with, uh, say, indoor retail. We've shown that we can celebrate our mass uh, safely. We have safety protocols that have been scientifically proven to be effective. They prevent outbreaks. Uh, when we have been able to worship, I insist that our priests follow them so we can keep our people safe and we can worship indoors. We don't understand why large department stores are able to uh, operate at a certain percentage of capacity when people can be inside there for two, three hours. The employees are inside all day. We can keep our services to about an hour and keep our people safe. So we're looking basically for equality. And Bishop Hodges, what about South Bay United Pentecostal? Are you seeking a 25% capacity allowance? <clears throat> Actually, we're asking uh, for no restrictions to be imposed regarding numbers or percentages. We are asking that churches be allowed to operate with the least restrictions placed on any other operations allowed indoors. Churches are the only enterprise in California that's being regulated that actually has this constitutional guarantee, the exception clause, if you will. But we're not actually even asking for the exception to the degree that there be no restrictions at all. But if there are any restrictions necessary, if this pandemic is of such an exigentic emergency uh, nature that requires restrictions, then the least restrictions applied to any other enterprise allowed to operate should be applied to churches. And if there is a complete shutdown, churches should be the last to close and the first to open. Churches are not only essential, we contend they are the most essential enterprise and operation in the state of California. Archbishop Cardellone, why do you want people to gather in person? The church is an assembly of people. Uh, it's in our nature to, to gather as, uh, as the body of Christ. In addition to that, uh, as Catholics, we're a sacramental church. We have, we have sacraments. Sacraments cannot be uh, live streamed. You can't, cannot receive communion virtually. It has to be in person. This is at the heart of who we are. I, I do accept that the government has some authority to regulate our worship. I agree with Bishop Hodges that it should be least restrictive on churches because the government has no authority to tell us we cannot worship. That's not the government's business. The government's business is to protect public health. Just like when we build a church, we build a church to code, but the government doesn't tell us how to arrange our worship space. So uh, we need to gather together. We can gather together safely. The government has no authority to tell us not to. We've been uh, enduring this unjust discrimination for a long time. We want to be cooperative. We produce safety protocols that work. We should be allowed to use them. Archbishop, I understand that you have safety measures in place in terms of distancing and wearing masks if one was to attend church. But when it comes to communion, isn't that a hand-to-mouth sort of contact that would be ripe for infection to spread? It's possible to give communion uh, without touching the person receiving communion, whether it's in the hand or, or in the mouth. Uh, so we ask our communion ministers to be very careful. If they do make contact, where they're told to have hand sanitizer nearby, where they can sa sanitize their hands before they give communion to the next. Uh, it's a very brief encounter. It's only a few seconds, so the people are not close to each other for an extended period of time. The study that was done on the 1 million masses celebrated over a 14 week period that found no outbreaks uh, in any of those masses. I spoke with two of those specialists who conducted that uh, research and they, they said there was no danger of spreading the virus if communion is given correctly. Bishop Hodges, you've taken your challenge to the Supreme Court not once but twice and there has been positive news for you in the past week in that the Supreme Court threw out the restrictions in New York and they sent a case back in California saying uh, to the judge that they should look at it again and look at it in light of their decision in New York. What do you take as a message from these judicial decisions? Well this is a game changer. This is a game changer for churches all across America. Now, while these are narrowly tailored and specific to the cases involved, and specifically, they're dealing with an emergency injunction, which is very narrowly tailored, and that's what we had denied by a narrow five to four split decision at the end of May at the Supreme Court was also on our injunction. So the Supreme Court has not yet heard any church case on its merits. 
Uh, we right now have a cert before the Supreme Court uh, asking for just that. Our full case resides right now at the Ninth Circuit, but they're waiting on the Supreme Court to decide whether they'll take our cert or not. Uh, but it is a game changer. Basically, it signals the only significant difference between the uh, merits or the data in our case and the case from Nevada in July and the case in New York last week and the case this week in uh, Pasadena, California, the only significant difference is the complexion of the court. And so now that Justice uh, Barrett has replaced Justice Ginsburg, the complexion of the court has changed. And it is a signal that the court is now going to come down more on the side of religious liberty and favoring our churches and allowing worshipers to go back to their house of worship. So, Bishop Hodges, would you then hope that the Supreme Court would revisit other conservative causes, such as right to life, Roe v. Wade? Well, certainly that would be our hope. That's you know part of our moral uh, convictions and biblical convictions. But uh, I don't see you know all of these conjoined together necessarily. I think one step at a time. Honestly, the fight that we're fighting right now for religious liberty strikes at the very heart of all liberties in America. And everyone in America, whether you're religious or not, whether you believe in God or not, believe in the Bible or not, really you should believe in the guarantee of the Constitution to religious liberty because that's why our nation was founded. We're celebrating the 400 year of the Mayflower Compact. And they specifically stated Mayflower Compact is the first governing document in America, and they specifically mention God four times and state that they're coming here to the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. And of course, our Constitution allows for people to worship the God of the Bible freely. Mm -hmm. And that is the first of all guaranteed freedoms in the Constitution. So everything follows along with that. It's kind of like a domino effect. If we lose our religious liberty freedoms, next is going to be the freedom to speech, the freedom to right. assemble, the freedom of press, the freedom to have redress of grievances. Everything hinges on that religious and liberty freedom. That's the linchpin of America. Archbishop Carleone, I see you nodding your head in agreement there. Will you also be filing legal action? It's not something I would want to do. I want to wait and see what the district court does now with this, uh, now that they have to reissue their decision uh, for this injunction. It, I would not take that off the table, but it's not really in our instinct to do that. Our faith dictates we need to be responsible citizens, good neighbors. We're trying to be good neighbors. We've been cooperative. We don't want an adversarial relationship. I'm still hoping this can be worked out in a more amicable way. Uh, but uh, it's it's we're beginning to lose patience with this uh, this unjust uh, discrimination and, and oppression of us. Yes, I agree totally with what Bishop Hodges said, and I was thinking of a, a letter that the, the D Department of Justice sent to the mayor here in San Francisco that had even more restrictive limitations than the state guidelines, uh, but had some a lot of gems of wisdom in there. But one in particular that stands out in my mind, where they made the point precisely that Bishop Hodges was making where it said that the, the Constitution's unyielding protection of religious believers distinguishes the United States from places dominated by tyranny and despotism. So this is important to everyone in America. So when do you think your patience might come to an end and that you might file legal action? We have Christmas coming up. Uh, I cannot see us being shut out of our churches at Christmas. Uh, legal action is one option. I want to explore what other options there are as well. But it will all depend on what the district court decides with this injunction decision. All right. Uh, Bishop Hodges, what's your general response to the pending new restrictions put into place by Governor Newsom this week? Well, our response is we all need to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. We all need to practice, you know, safe CDC recommendations and protocols. But our position is these have got to be generally applied. They cannot be specific and discriminatory as they have been. And uh, so our churches can certainly put protocols in place. I argue that our churches have the safest protocols of any institution in the city, in the county, in the state. So that is not really the issue. The issue is allow people to go to church under the same or even we think better protocols and protections than what they are allowed to do in any other facet or arena of society. Let people go to church. If you're going to shut churches down, everything has got to be shut down. But if anything is going to be allowed to be open, churches have to be allowed to be open. But we will practice safe practices. And, 
Archbishop Cardiglione, do you see this uh, debate as a classic conflict between church and state or faith and science? I see it as an unnecessary conflict between church and state. The, there is no conflict between faith and science if both are understood correctly. There should not be this conflict. Uh, again, if the state just treated us equally, uh, Bishop Hodges was speaking about safety protocols. We've all developed, not all many of us have developed safety protocols. San Francisco asked faith communities to submit safety plans back in May for when looking forward to when they were going to reopen for worship. In the meantime, the city approved uh, operation, safety operation plans for stores and they went back into operation, but we still haven't heard anything back with our safety plans for our faith communities. These protocols work. People are kept safe. We can, we can worship safely. There's no reason for this conflict. We have just a very few moments left. As leaders in the faith community, what do you want to say to Californians in this difficult time? Bishop Hodges. Keep your faith in God. Keep going to your house of worship. And let's believe, God, this pandemic is going to end and we're going to succeed in the end. Uh, Archbishop Cordelioni. Stay strong in faith, stay, stay strong in hope, stay connected with your faith community, access your, your uh, faith community and sacraments as you can, keep prayer alive in your home. Thank you both, gentlemen. Thank you. Let's take a look now at something beautiful. The Civic Center in Marin County is an unusual building designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in the late 1950s. He didn't live to see the completion of the structure, but it has received the honor of being both a California and a national historical landmark. And you can find more of our news coverage at kqed.org slash kqednewsroom. I'm Priya David Clemens. You can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Priya D. Clemens. From all of us here at KQED Newsroom, thank you for joining us. Good night.